Hi Apes, today we're taking a look at Unit 6, Part 6, where we'll wrap up our last three renewable energy sources, which are water, geothermal, and fuel cells. So we'll start with water. Water can be used in a couple of different ways, so we'll go through the different methods. Um, but on a large scale, what you tend to think of are dams. So hydrothermal dam or hydropower dams like the Hoover Dam. But also, what's starting to get more attention uh, is taking advantage of the tidal differences, the height tidal differences, as well as the perpetual motion of waves. Tidal power. Tidal power is a form of hydropower that converts the energy from the natural rise and fall of the tides into electricity. Tides are caused by the combined effects of gravitational forces exerted by the moon, the sun, and the rotation of the earth. Tidal plants can only be installed along coastlines. Coastlines often experience two high tides and two low tides on a daily basis. The difference in water levels must be at least five meters high to produce electricity. Tidal electricity can be created from several technologies, the main ones being tidal barrages, tidal fences, and tidal turbines. Tidal barrages are the most efficient tidal energy sources. A tidal barrage is a dam that utilizes the potential energy generated by the change in height between high and low tides. This energy turns a turbine or compresses air, which in turn creates electricity. Tidal fences are turbines that operate like giant turnstiles, whereas tidal turbines are similar to wind turbines, only underwater. In both cases, electricity is generated when the mechanical energy of tidal currents turns turbines connected to a generator. The generator produces electricity. Ocean currents generate relatively more energy than air currents because ocean water is 832 times more dense than air and therefore applies greater force on the turbines. Tidal power is easy to install and renewable, having no direct greenhouse gas emissions and a low environmental impact. Because the ocean's tidal patterns are well understood, tidal energy is a very predictable energy source, making it highly attractive for electrical grid management. This sets it apart from other renewables that can be more unpredictable. However, adoption of tidal technologies has been slow, and so far the amount of power generated using tidal power plants is very small. This is due largely to the very specific site requirements necessary to produce tidal electricity. Additionally, tide cycles do not always match the daily consumption patterns of electricity, and therefore do not provide sufficient capacity to satisfy demand. That's tidal power. Now there's another type of technology that can take advantage of waves, um, particularly on uh, rocky coastlines where you can use the displacement of, um, uh, you can create a, a, a cavern that um, as the waves come in it displaces air that turns a turbine um, and then it will pull out. So you have um, both uh, air displacing as a wave crashes in and air displacing as it comes out. Um, and that can create this perpetual motion of energy. So there are a lot of new technologies that are being developed to take advantage of both tides and waves. Now probably the more traditional way that we think of water power is with a large scale dam. Hydropower. Hydropower, or hydroelectricity, refers to the conversion of energy from flowing water into electricity. It is considered a renewable energy source because the water cycle is constantly renewed by the sun. One of the first uses of hydroenergy was for mechanical milling, such as grinding grains. But today, modern hydro plants produce electricity using turbines and generators. The mechanical energy created by moving water spins rotors on a turbine. This turbine is connected to an electromagnetic generator, which produces electricity when the turbine spins. There are two main types of hydroelectricity production, dams and run of river. Hydro dams utilize the potential energy from dammed water to produce electricity. A dam is a large barrier constructed to raise the level of water and control its flow. The elevation created by the dam creates gravitational force for turning the turbine when water is released. Some dams also contain an additional reservoir at their base where water is stored to be pumped to the higher reservoir for release when electricity is in demand. This is referred to as pumped storage hydro. The second now one thing to think about with this diagram is the different types of energy. So here you can see when it's up here, this is going to be potential energy. Pumped storage hydro. The second form. This is going to be potential energy. 
and as it moves through, that's kinetic. So up here, it's potential. when electricity is in Sorry. demand. Up here, it's potential. As it moves through, that's kinetic. When it turns the turbine, that's mechanical, and converted into electricity, that's the electric energy. So just the different conversions, and every step along the way, you do lose um, energy based on the second law of thermodynamics. This is referred to as pumped storage hydro. The second form of hydroelectricity production is run of river hydro. Run of river still uses turbines and generators, but relies on natural water flow rates of rivers, diverting just a portion of the water through turbines. Because run of river hydro is subject to natural water variability, it is more intermittent than dammed hydro. There are various sizes of hydro plants that produce electricity. Large hydro, greater than 30 megawatts, small hydro, 100 kilowatts to 30 megawatts, and micro hydro, less than 100 kilowatts. The Hoover Dam in the United States is a whopping 2,074 megawatts, which is enough to serve 1.3 million people. Of all renewable energy sources, hydropower holds the largest share of worldwide electricity production. Hydropower has several benefits. It is a cost competitive form of electricity, even though the initial building cost can be high. It is quite reliable compared to other renewable options and pairs well with other sources as it can be used as base load power. In some cases, dammed reservoirs can also help with flood control and be a reliable water supply for communities. There are also some concerns with hydropower, especially when it comes to large dams. Damming a river has a major impact on the local environment, changing wildlife habitats, blocking fish passage, and often forcing people in riverside communities to move out of their homes. Now one uh, big concern that I have about dams um, is your terminology. So one thing to think about is here on this diagram, this is upstream of the dam. So this is the reservoir that was created and this is downstream of the dam. There's often going to be questions that refer to dams and you will have to know the impacts upstream. That upstream there's a lot of flooding, but downstream you can control that flow. In addition, dam failures can be catastrophic, claiming the lives of those living downstream. Hydro plants are also not completely free of greenhouse gas emissions. As with most forms of energy, carbon dioxide emissions happen during construction, particularly due to the large quantities of cement used, and plant matter in the flooded areas makes methane, another greenhouse gas, as it decays underwater. That's hydropower. Okay, so just to review the pros and cons that they did a good job of going over in that movie, um, is that some of the advantages are that it's abundant and that it's clean, but again with this clean, making sure that you note that that means um, no CO2, no particulate matter, no NOx, no SOx, from the direct use of that power. Um, like they said, the construction of that dam can definitely um, lead to the release of CO2 and some of these pollutants. Now some of the pros of the dams that she went over is that it can control downstream flooding, um, like I said, uh, below the dam, so control downstream flooding, and it can create a reservoir. So that reservoir is actually um, a very good thing that that reservoir could provide water for agriculture, um, could provide water for recreation, for drinking, it can create jobs. Um, so there are some definite pros of dams, um, and this is a common AP topic that they like to bring up, or the, the pros of dams. So you can control downstream flooding, you can create a reservoir that has a steady supply of water for agriculture or recreation or fishing, um, and it does create jobs to run a dam. Now the disadvantage though um, is that upstream of the dam you do have flooding, and that creates a tremendous loss of habitat, um, but also downstream. So downstream of the flooding, uh, or I'm sorry, downstream of the dam, you do have a very reduced habitat. Your river is much smaller, so you've lost a lot of habitat on the river itself. So the river has changed its shape um, and become smaller. So that is a loss of habitat both upstream and downstream and you do have to be very specific as to what you have uh, because they're opposite problems. Now um, other problems with our dam is that it often will block fish paths. 
So fish like to migrate upstream often to mate. And as they're swimming upstream, you might run into the dam and won't be able to pass it. Now they do have um, uh, fish ladders now that will help you. So if I have a river flowing this way and my dam is created right here, now upstream, I had a river and now I'm going to have a reservoir. Okay, and downstream now I'm going to have a much smaller river. Okay, so my habitat will get much smaller. Now if I'm a fish and I'm trying to swim upstream, I'm not going to be able to make it. I'm not going to be able to hop that dam. So there are some things that they've created called fish ladders that will go around the dam and allow them to bypass that dam. Um, so this isn't in every dam, this is going to be in some larger ones, um, but if they can, they can create what's called a fish ladder, which is almost like a stair step way that allows them to go up and around the dam to, to be able to go back up to mate. Um, another problem is as water is forced out of this dam, it creates a lot of bubbles on large scale dams and that can actually kill fish. They can get caught in the turbines as they're trying to swim downstream. So there definitely are some cons to these large scale dams. Now another major source of power that is very, very site specific is something that's called geothermal. So with geothermal, this is heat from the earth. So here there are two kind of ways that we can take a look at it. We can take a look at using heated groundwater, or we can just take a look at the insulative properties of soil itself. So if we think about large scale, this is using heated groundwater. So the source of it is heat from the interior of the earth. Now the most common places you're going to find this at are plate boundaries. So this is why something um, like Iceland is very well known for their hydrothermal power, or th I'm sorry, for their geothermal power, because they are sitting right on a divergent boundary. So they'll use heated groundwater, they'll pump it up, create steam, and that steam will be used to turn a turbine. So here they have access to heated groundwater, they pump it up and pressurize it, that is forced through to turn a turbine, that turbine is connected to a generator, and then we have to condense that water and pump it back down. So this is a non-consumptive use of that geothermal energy. So this can be used on a very large scale. Now on a smaller scale, we might use ground heat pumps um, where we take advantage of um, the quality of energy to go from high to low or from warm to, to cool. So when you're in a cooling mode, this would be in the summertime, what you do is you pump heat out of your house, pump it underground, and the heat is dispersed into the ground and that cools the air. So because the air that's coming through those pipes is warmer than the ground surrounding it, the heat will go out from high to low and the air coming back into your house will be cooler. Now it also works the other way, that when the ground is warmer than the air, you can pump cool air in, pump that underground, it will absorb some heat from the soils, and then the air coming back in will be warmer. And you can actually do this with air or water. So the advantages are no air or water pollution, again from the direct use of this, um, and again, just to be clear, that means no CO2, no SOX, no NOx, um, and no particulate matter, just to be very specific. Um, but the disadvantages is that the setup and the maintenance can be really expensive because groundwater can have a lot of minerals in it that might be corrosive, and it's not going to be a, a fuel source that you can use everywhere. So the final one are fuel cells. So fuel cells are something that are starting to get more attention but are still kind of struggling with. Um, now with fuel cells you have chemical energy that's converted directly into electricity. So what we do is we combine the fuel source that's traditionally hydrogen, we combine that with oxygen, and then the waste product is water. So hydrogen is the most common fuel. Um, the pros here is that it's very efficient. There's not a lot of conversions, and so you don't have a lot of waste. Um, but one of the biggest cons is getting that hydrogen. Uh, we just don't have a mechanism for delivery yet. So I do want to show a video that shows how these hydrogen cells work. 
Have you heard about the new sustainable energy technology called fuel cells? In fact, they're really not that new. Fuel cells were invented in 1839 by William Grove and were developed by Pratt & Whitney and other companies in the 1950s. Safe and dependable, they were used by NASA and the Russian space program to power spacecrafts. Today, leading global companies like Apple, Verizon, and Coca-Cola use fuel cells to generate clean power. Honda, Toyota, and other car companies use them to power their new generation of pollution-free cars. So how do fuel cells work? Fuel cells use hydrogen and oxygen in a chemical process to produce electricity and heat. The only byproduct, pure, clean water. A fuel cell has two electrodes, an anode and a cathode, and between them, an electrolyte. The catalyst on the electrode breaks the H2 hydrogen molecules to allow them to combine with hydroxide, OH negative ions, to create water and release electricity. But unlike batteries, fuel cells don't store power for a limited amount of time. They generate it for as long as you have hydrogen. As a source of backup power, fuel cells are much better than diesel generators. They aren't smelly or noisy, and they don't produce harmful exhaust. <coughs> Fuel cells can be used anywhere you need backup power. Mobile phone towers, electrical substations, manufacturing, and much, much more. Other green power solutions harness the sun or wind. But if you're caught up in a cloudy day or on days where the air stands still, these solutions can leave you without enough power when you actually need it. That's why you need GenCell, a proven green power solution that keeps you running no matter what. So as you saw, the fuel cells, while maybe not something that we are looking at currently as a large scale power source, definitely something as a backup to one of these when we may not have the energy that we need. So a good backup to wind, a good backup to solar, a good backup to water power, but also something that we're looking at to run our cars. Um, just not on a large scale at this point, but definitely something that you might be hearing about more in the future. Now, how do we encourage these changes? One of the biggest things that I predict will do this is economics. Um, what we need to do is make sure that we are making the sources of energy that we want to be used affordable. We do that with subsidies where the government lowers the purchase price and we do that with tax breaks or taxing. So with subsidies that will lower the, the purchase price of the item you want, say if we want to encourage solar power, we can subsidize solar cells to make them cheaper to buy. Um, another way is tax breaks. So if you give a tax break on something like for Energy Star appliances, if you buy new Energy Star appliances, you get a tax break on your taxes. You can reduce some money that you pay. So those are ways to monetarily encourage people, um, but also improving the technology that we have now to transmit that electricity, making sure that we're conserving electricity by improving our electrical grid. So we do have to work with what we have. What we saw is that there are lots of different options for energy, but not every one is going to fit every area. So you have to be flexible in the choices that you make and make sure that you have backups for some and recognize that all have their pros and cons.